Sophie, uh, sorry, my screen just moved. So Sophie Stanizuska from the University of Warwick, and she will be talking about public involvement in mathematical and economic modelling. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Sophie. Thank you very much. And just checking, you can see my screen okay? Yep, great. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation to speak. Um, I'm Sophie Staniszewska, I'm based at the medical school and I lead a programme of research all about patient and public involvement. And so this might feel very different from the rest of the presentations that you've been listening to, but I guess I want to introduce something which is really important in terms of wider consideration of public perspectives, um, attitudes and perceptions within a modelling context. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that we've had running at Warwick for a number of years, the MEMV study, which Ed Hill was involved with and Matt Keeling, um, and just take you into a maybe a different world around what the public um, can actually offer us. So just to make sure that we're on the same sort of page, when we talk about patient and public involvement, we're talking about research that's carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. So that's, that's quite an old NIHR definition, but it's one that we still use and still drives our work. Um, and you can see the distinction there in terms of partnership. So a lot of the research that we carried out is really about um, research that finds out about what people think or understands their perceptions. What we're talking about here is very much about co-producing research with public contributors and they can be involved all the way through from identification of questions to design of studies to synthesis to analysis dissemination. So this is the way that um, a lot of our funders are encouraging research to, um, to focus on public involvement and the impact it can bring can be really significant and we've got a quote here from um, NIHR involved 2019 and it's really about the changes, the benefits, the learning that we gain from insights and experiences and it can transform a project when you're working in partnership with a group. So, so why do we do it? Um, you may or may not be familiar with public involvement. Um, there is a growing evidence base that supports this way of working. So the evidence base shows us it can make research more relevant, it can make it more focused on questions of importance to people, um, it can enhance the quality, for example, measuring um, the right outcomes in a trial, but also there's something about the moral or ethical imperative. And I think people in the public feel this very strongly, nothing about me without me, particularly people um, affected by health conditions. In addition, we see uh, uh, this concept of democratic accountability to taxpayers. So the research that you undertake is funded often by taxpayers who have a democratic right to have a voice in that. So the fairness, accountability and transparency element is really important. So public involvement in modeling for a pandemic. Um, we see a lot of public involvement in health services research and social care research. Modelling is not an area that, where it is common. Um, and we were lucky with the MEMV study that when we started out, and I can't quite remember when that was, it was about 2015, uh, we had a policy maker in the Department of Health who commissioned the work who really wanted to find out about what is the public role in modelling. And I think with his support, um, we were able to undertake this exploration. So I guess from my perspective, there's something about, if we think about all the data we look at, um, it sits in a wider social context and each bit of data that we consider is part of a bigger story and it's part of people's lives um, and the way in which people behave and how we as a society, society then respond to that can be really important here. And I think it's probably worth reflecting on when, when COVID hit, um, or just before COVID hit, public involvement in research was working really, really well. And I think the health, the HRA, our ethical sort of regulator, um, noted that 78% of ethical applications going through HRA had PPI in them. And as COVID progressed, that dropped to 18%. So public involvement in research took a big hit and people have reflected on that and been really critical of that, that loss because I think a lot of COVID research 
didn't have that public involvement helping to shape it. And we've seen that evolving much, much more, um, particularly with long COVID groups, but it was a big gap in, in the work. So, so um, on, with that reflection in mind, I think, um, I guess it's also worth us reflecting that um, many of the sort of um, modeling approaches probably still assume quite a passive approach with people as sort of observed units doing certain things that help us in our thinking. And I guess what I'm trying to put to you is that there's a strong argument for engaging with patients and the public and our communities as much more active agents in research that informs pandemic planning. So I think we've sort of um, had, had quite a, a, an interesting 18 months of this and certainly in our modeling work it, it impacted because our modeling team focused on COVID. There was much less focus on the economic aspects and there was much less focus on the sort of um, public involvement aspects. So, so the work I'm going to present to you is very much pre-COVID but has important implications for how we take that forward. So MEMV, the Mathematical and Economic Modeling for Vaccination and Immunization Evaluation, um, it was a project where Warwick um, operated as a second opinion modeler to what was then Public Health England. Um, so we were uh, commissioned to undertake a number of models depending on need. Um, and as I said before, our policy um, commissioner, I guess, was very aware that there was much less public involvement and was really interested in exploring what it looked like in these complex areas that are often quite hidden from um, the public. Um, and of course, modelling is vital, isn't it? It's so important. It provides our decision makers with the best available evidence to reach a decision. And so it's really incumbent on us to make sure the best available evidence reflects society's trends and perceptions and um, the, the broader view of the public. So from our perspective, we were interested in seeing whether involving the patients and the public would enhance models, would improve confidence and accelerate decision making. So just in summary, the sort of key outcomes of MEMV were um, a framework that we developed to identify the nature and the type of involvement to guide future models, the values that underpin that interaction, the conditions you need for implementation of the framework, and um, we developed a long form version and a, a short form version, which I'll, I'll tell you a bit about um, shortly. So what did it involve? What did we actually do? Well, it was quite a slow, slow burner. We had 21 meetings over five years, very much responsive to what the Department of Health wanted. Each meeting was lasting two to three hours. As we progressed, the meetings became longer because there was more to discuss and more to say. And lots of email contact with the group in between, commenting on documents, um, inputting in lots of different ways. And we sort of conceptualise these meetings as something called a, a deliberative knowledge space. And what I mean by that is that the team would present on a method or an approach or a concept and we would use think aloud techniques to try and encourage the public contributors to engage with that. And through that conversation, which was multi-layered, and as we progressed, became more and more complex and more insightful and more well-informed, public, the public contributors were able to um, make a number of different sorts of contributions. And there were sorts of things, um, for example, like um, we had conversations about the data that was being used and they challenged the nature and the content and the origins of the data, the basis for the data collection, um, interpretation of the data, and very much sort of thinking outside of the box in a safe space where sometimes the modelers could rework their thinking. So there was one particular model that wasn't working and the team said, oh, we're going to talk to a few different groups about why it's not working. And I said, bring it to the public involvement group as well. And they did. And the conversation by then, the, the group had learned a lot about modeling. They were able to engage and make suggestions about things like granularity of data. And that wasn't always, um, th there was sort of trigger, there were trigger conversations because the group didn't have that data to hand, but they were saying um, the public contributors were asking questions which made the team think about why they had made certain decisions, why they had made certain assumptions about the model. So over time, we were um, drawing on that discussion and developing sort of themes, um, the sort of a thematic development 
trying to identify what does contribution look like so we were doing the doing of public involvement but we were also capturing it and um, sort of almost theoretically trying to develop our understanding of what was what was happening and how we could develop our framework as well so this is just um, some of the, the um, formatting has moved around a little bit on this, but just to give you a, an, an idea, this is a sort of a, a, a summary of some of the thinking. And um, we uh, tried to, the, the short form version is, is much shorter. The long form version of the framework is really long, but you can still access it through our paper. But we tried to identify the steps that we take in construction of models and to think about what the PPI contribution would look like. And so some of the themes, these are macro themes um, that emerged were things like reviewing the context and relevance of the work, assessing the data, justifying the model choice, troubleshooting, um, and then a bit about interpreting and reviewing outcomes and decision making. But within each of these steps in our long form framework, we have a very detailed um, description of the different sorts of contribution that public that the public can make. So through the discussion of each of these elements for the different project, we were able to identify what that might look like. So it was a really interesting process. Um, and I think the framework can be uh, used in part or you can um, use all of it if you want but that's our next step is really we were about to start testing the long form framework when COVID hit and uh, nobody was really interested in public involvement in the same way at that point. Okay so just to give you a few reflections um, this was not an easy project um, our public contributors and our research team, I think in the first 12 months, we were wondering exactly what we were trying to achieve. And our one of our contributors said, you know, we, we had no picture of what public involvement would look like. We had no roadmap to guide our journey. Um, and, you know, these sorts of challenges were really important to us. The researchers we were working with had no idea of what they wanted from us, and the, or even if they could add anything useful to their model. So the first year was really, really challenging and I think my role was to encourage the dialogue so that we could identify what those contributions would look like and here's an, here's another one so a key breakthrough was this repre representation of the model I've just shown you for the first time we understood modeling as a process and provided a framework through which we could start to organize and structure our contributions so I think when we pinned people down in the team to write it up in that way it was a real shift in thinking so that we had a had something to organize around and then one of our academic um, contributors in the team, I won't read all of that, but from this bit in the middle, from my perspective, being given the opportunity to convey the work to public members through reasoned discourse, ensured justification of modeling aspects, aiding model integrity and validity. So there was the, the, that discussion really, really helped refine some of the sort of aspects of validity and some of the um, assumptions that were being made. And in a way, you know, for us, modeling was a bit like making a cake. Somebody does decide on what goes into it, ingredients, how much, in what way, and what you come out with. And because of the aspects that are being discussed, there is a public role there. So just to summarize, MEMV, um, what we produced at the end of this process and in the paper, we um, provided the short form framework, the long form framework. We also have produced a table that is quite complex, but captures the context for implementation. So what do you need to have in place as a modeling team to use MEMV and to make sure it works well? And importantly as well, the values that underpin it, um, it's vital that there is discussion about the perspectives people are coming from so that that can be um, understood. And then just to conclude very quickly, so our, our framework is ready for application and refinement. Um, our work shows that it is feasible. You can involve the public in these methodologically complex areas such as modelling. It's feasible. But it's really important we continue this exploration of the potential of public involvement in modelling. And I think um, Mike, Mike's mentioned earlier of things like the education context and certainly conversations with my children about the education context have identified a whole range of concepts and variables that could inform future modelling. Even at that level, it's been really interesting hearing their perspectives. And I think modelling is 
has been hidden. Um, when we started out, nobody really talked about modelling, but it is now so much part of our society. And, um, you know, it's a representation of how we might respond to a pandemic. And I think it then is incumbent, incumbent on us to think about how we bring that public perspective into this. So um, from my view, the societal input is, is vital and we need to think about that. And so the co-production of future models, I think, will be really important to show to sort of ensure our policy recommendations are rooted in the best co-produced science. And we need to capture those concepts of importance and relevance. And, you know, we need to root this in the reality of life. And that's what we've been trying to do. So I will um, stop there because I've gone slightly over. Thank you very much, Sophie. That's an interesting perspective on um, modelling. Um, so are there any questions for Sophie? Um, in the chat or raise your hands. Uh, Elizabeth, please do unmute. Hello. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I found this really interesting because um, we had a project, a COVID rapid response project to model test, trace and isolate strategies in the UK um, over, it just finished a couple of months ago. And we did intend to try and include public engagement in this. And for um, a set of reasons that got going relatively late within the project. And I think what we did really wouldn't count as a kind of co-production, but it did, the process of doing that did make us think a lot about um, what, you know, what public engagement might bring to the modeling project along a whole range of issues from structure and types of models used and, you know, parameter ranges to the kinds of trade-offs that we might be looking at within the modeling um, and then how, you know, different how different behaviors might be clustered and how they might change over the process of the pandemic and really what research questions we should be focusing on based on how people are actually using different technologies like different testing technologies in practice. Um, but I thought it was interesting from your study how long it took you to get a good interaction going um, with, the, with, the public, uh, with the public members of your, or the, the non-academic members of your group. And I was interested to understand what you thought might make it feasible to do good PPI in the context of a rapid response kind of epidemic um, situation. Um, so I had a question about, is, is that about tools? Is it about having a more standing collaboration? Um, and then I also had a question about how you thought the media discussion of modeling and framing it very much as a kind of prediction might affect how the public understand what modeling to be and what it's trying to do. But maybe, maybe those are two questions. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for that, Elizabeth. Um, I, I, I think um, it, it's really interesting how in that first year, I think we were, it was so new and there was no, there were no published examples of, of how we might go about this. And I knew of one other study where public involvement had, there had been a public involvement group, but as is often the way when people involve members of the public, they don't then write them up, write that up and publish it. So, I knew that they'd done some fantastic work, but there was no sign of it. There was no trace of it. There was nothing for us to build on. That's why we wanted to publish our paper. So, um, so I think I think um, that meant that in the first year we were we, we were trying to create this sort of deliberative knowledge space and feel our way along, and we didn't have this sense of which direction we wanted to go in. Our previous experience shows that if you bring if you bring people into an environment where they feel safe to contribute, where they feel looked after, and that's the whole team, that's the researchers as well as the, the public contributors, and you start a dialogue that allows clarifications of concepts and methods, and you start that discussion, over time that becomes a multi-layered sort of critique. And, and out of that, you can take concepts. You, I, my job was to spot them and say, gosh, that's interesting. So we're, 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 there's lots of things going on here about assumptions in models. And how do we capture that? And how do we critique them? And how do the team know that they're making the right assumptions on based on what? So, so it, that was the sort of um, almost a settling in phase. But you see now, if we were starting now, and we, we've got our paper, so you know, a modeler doesn't have to go through that in the same way. They've got our long form framework to go through every single potential step of a model and to look at what does that contribution look like and that the, the sort of basis of that in terms of the context for implementation table means they they've got a really clear 
direction of what to set in place first so you know it, it shouldn't be like that anymore but I, I've done this in a number of areas now that are quite complex like um, machine learning and um, sort of genomics where we, we, we use a similar approach of exploration and it has to emerge from that if you haven't got anything before and the, with the media question I know I mean gosh when we started out no one knew about modeling <laughs> now everybody does um, I think I think whatever the media say would would we'd have to account for that in some way i think we'd have to have conversations about what people thought about modeling now um and because we've had a big break with the the group because um the team have had to focus on covid you know 100 percent it's been really difficult to to do that so we're just starting out again bringing the group back to look at another something that isn't covid which is quite a novelty for the group um but, but that is a conversation we need to have of where has this left people's perceptions and how do, what do we do if there's anything in there that's going to impact on their evaluation. So, so I think it's, it's, um, it's been challenging, but, but they've been a gr great group to work with and, and uh, we've really enjoyed it. Thank, thanks very much. Um, I found this all very helpful, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs>